Good evening, everyone. We're going to be studying now Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. So I encourage you to have a, a Bible in front of you, also your study questions. And uh, before we get to Matthew 3, uh, I want to just read this prophecy in the book of Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. God speaking through the, Mal through the prophet Malachi said, Elijah's coming. Well, now, the, the people in the days of Jesus, uh, they thought that this was uh, a literal going to be a literal thing where Elijah would come back to the earth, even though he had been dead for many years. It's obvious from reading Matthew 11, 13, and 14 that Jesus took it figurative, though. And he said, no, he meant John, John the Baptist. After the preaching of Malachi, for 400 years, the prophets had been silent. And then John came. And in Matthew 3, 1 through 17, we're reading about the preaching of John along with the baptism of Jesus. Now, here's a general outline of what we're going to be studying this evening. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, John is calling sinners, calling them to repentance. In verses 7 through 12, John is cautioning sinners. They've come to be baptized of him, but now he's cautioning them. In verse 11, we're going to be focusing on that then, and uh, there he contrasts baptisms. There has been more than one baptism, so we're going to contrast those baptisms from studying Matthew 3, verse 11. Finally, in Matthew 3, 13 through 17, there is the baptism of Jesus, and a point or two we need to make from that. So now Matthew 3, 1 through 6, Jesus is calling sinners. Now, to introduce John, Matthew mentions two characteristics that he had. He was called the Baptist, and secondly, he was a preacher. Now, your, your first question was, what was the significance of John being called John the Baptist? Well, actually, the term Baptist means one who baptizes. And uh, so that's a reference to something that John did. He baptized. In fact, in Mark chapter 6, verse 14, where the, the New King James Version, which I usually preach from, it calls John, John the Baptist. The American Standard Version there calls him John the Baptizer. And actually, that's the, the meaning of that. John the Baptist, that is, John one who baptized. He was John the Baptizer. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, the Bible refers to Philip as Philip the Evangelist. And he's called Philip the Evangelist because uh, Philip evangelized. Now, John is called John the Baptist because John baptized people. Now, another characteristic that Matthew mentions is that John was a preacher because it says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 that in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He came preaching in the wilderness. Now, he didn't preach in the cities and in the villages where the people were, but he preached in the wilderness, and the people actually went out to him. Now, in verse 2, we have John's message. In John chapter 3, verse 2, here's what he's saying when he preached in the wilderness, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The second study question that I gave you was, what was John's mission and message? Well, his mission and message are really essentially the same, uh, and that is he was telling the people to repent. He was preparing the way for Jesus. This was his mission, to go before Jesus, to prepare the way before him, to point to Jesus and his coming, and to call on the people to repent. His message then was one of repentance, and repentance, we understand, is a change of mind that produces a changed life. He preached repentance, it says in verse 2, because 
the kingdom of heaven was at hand, meaning it was near. John knew that. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 1, uh, here we have John uh, preaching, or, at least, or excuse me, Jesus preaching, and he said, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. So Jesus preached unto them saying that there would be some people on earth at that time who was listening to him speak who would actually live to see the kingdom. Now, if the kingdom is not in existence now, like uh, perhaps uh, the majority of the religious world is saying, all the premillennialists believe that the kingdom has been postponed and that it will come into existence at the second coming of Jesus when he will rule on the earth for 1,000 years. But if the kingdom is not in existence now, then uh, Daniel was uh, a false prophet because he prophesied in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, that the kingdom would come into existence during the time that Rome ruled the world. And also we can say that if the kingdom is not in existence now, then John the Baptist, he was a false teacher because he said the kingdom was near and he was preaching 2,000 years ago. Now, John was an anticipated prophet. People should have been anticipating his coming and his preaching because it says in Matthew 3, verse 3, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Matthew, in introducing John the Baptist, said, Well, this is the one who was spoken of earlier, back in the Old Testament. Isaiah and others spoke of him and of his coming. And we already read Malachi 4 or 5, where Malachi spoke of the coming of John. But now in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Now, in Isaiah chapter 40, we have a, a similar prophecy, and one that Matthew had in mind there in our text in Matthew chapter 3. All right, I'm going to read now in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, beginning with verse 3. Isaiah 40, verse 3. All right, here is this prophecy. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. Now, before Rome ruled the world, public roads were very rare. And when kings went on trips... And men were sent in advance of them in order to prepare a way. Now, that sometimes meant leveling mountains, uh, raising valleys, bridging rivers. John would go ahead of Jesus and prepare a way. He would prepare a way for him by preaching repentance and pointing the people to Christ. And now we're going to see more of this later. And now let's go to Matthew 3 and verse 4, and we read of John's appearance when he preached in the wilderness. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. John's clothing reflected his environment in the wilderness. Uh, he did not enjoy what we might call the, the comforts of home. His mission was to call people to repentance. And he himself was an example of self-denial. You might say that when John went around preaching repentance and trying to get people to 
uh, deny themselves. Well, then John was a, a living illustration of his own preaching. Now, in verses 5 and 6 of Matthew 3, we have the effect of John's preaching. How did the people respond to what he had to say? Well, it says in Matthew 3, 5 and 6, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. A large number of people then responded by confessing their sins and being baptized by John. John's baptism was immersion in water. And Mark chapter 1 verse 4 says that it was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. When John baptized people then, he was calling upon them to repent. He was calling on them to, to be baptized and it was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, the original word for the word for, for the remission of sins, is the same word used in Matthew 26, verse 28, when Jesus, instituting the Lord's Supper, said, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, Jesus shed his blood for the remission of sins. And, and the word in the original is the same word translated for in Acts 2.38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. We're baptized today for the remission of sins or for salvation. Now we're told in Mark 1 verse 4 that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. All right. Now... Jesus, or John, rather, in, in Matthew 3, beginning with verse 7, going through verse 12, he is found cautioning those sinners. Those sinners, all right, good. They've come uh, from all over, uh, responding to John's preaching, confessing their sins, being baptized. But now John is cautioning certain ones of those sinners, now, um, one of your study questions that I gave you was this. What did John tell the Pharisees and the Sadducees to do when they came to him in order to be baptized? And what idea did they have in their minds that might have prevented them from doing this? All right, now we're going to focus on that for just a little while. But, but first I want to say that when they came to be baptized, John doubted very much their sincerity. In John 3, verse, verse 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John said, You know, you're like a bunch of poisonous snakes. Uh, they, were, they were evil. And he sarcastically asked them, Well, you know, who gave you the idea to escape the, the, the judgment of God that is coming on sinners? So that is followed by verse 8, where John said, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Re repentance is more than just uh, giving lip service. It, it must be a true change of the heart resulting in actions. And John, looking at those scribes and Pharisees, he didn't see that repentance. There was no change in their actions. And so he cautioned them. That's what he's doing. He's cautioning them. He cautioned them not to get the idea that because they had Abraham's blood flowing through their veins, that they, they would be right with God. So in verse 9 he said, Do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. He said, don't, don't say that. Don't think we, don't, don't say that, oh, we have Abraham as our, our father. You see, John anticipated an objection on the part of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And their objection would be, 
Hey, we have Abraham's blood flowing through our veins. We, we're we descendants of the great father Abraham, so don't talk to us about repentance. Do not talk to us about how we need to change our lives. Having Abraham as their ancestor would not keep them from the punishment that was coming from God. And God was ready to cut down those unfruitful, unfaithful Jews and cast them into the un unquenchable fire. And that's why he mentions the fire uh, beginning in verse 10. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Uh, he mentions uh, fire in verse 12 when he said, his winnowing fan, uh, he's talking here about the one who was coming, Jesus. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, uh, here Christ is pictured as a, a farmer using a, a winnowing fork to toss the, the grain into the air. And the, the wind then would blow away the chaff or the, the husk. When Christ comes, the wheat will be separated from the chaff. The, that is, the righteous will be separated from the unrighteous, and the chaff will be burned with unquenchable fire. All right, now that leads us to verse 11, and we, we, we focus on another thing, and that is a contrast of baptisms. In verse 11, John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, John baptized with water only, but the one who is coming after John, Christ, would baptize with water and with the Holy Spirit and with fire. A study question I gave you was, what is meant by he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire? All right, first of all, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Very unique baptism. That wasn't meant for everybody and for all time. First of all, the apostles were baptized with the Holy Spirit. We read of this in the book of Acts chapter 2. Uh, verses 1 through 4. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, now that would be the apostles, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, overwhelmed by it, immersed with the Holy Spirit, you might say. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This baptism of the Holy Spirit enabled the apostles then to preach the Word of God and to miraculously speak in tongues there on the day of Pentecost, confirming that the message they were speaking was the Word of God. Now, there was only one other occurrence of baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that was when Cornelius and his household, these, these first Gentile converts to the Lord, were baptized with the Holy Spirit. B but it had a purpose. And uh, the purpose was when they were overwhelmed, immersed with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues that this would be a clear sign to everybody, including the Jews, that God also had the Gentiles in mind as subjects of his kingdom, fit subjects of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the Gentiles could be saved just as well as the Jews could be saved. Now, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, only two occurrences of it. 
Now, Christ would baptize with water. He would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And it says he would baptize with fire. Baptism with fire. Now, in verse 10 of Matthew 3, fire is used to destroy unfruitful trees. You remember we read that? And then in verse 12, remember reading that the fire would consume the, the chaff. This suggests that baptism with fire has something to do with judgment and destruction. Christ was speaking of the destruction that was coming upon them. Now, people, you, you don't want to be baptized with fire. Fire would suggest something that is of a, a destructive and, and punishing nature. All right, now let's read about Jesus' baptism in the last few verses of Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew 3, in verse 13, it says, Then, at that time, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. The word then, that means, suggests while John was preaching and baptizing. So at, at the time that we've really been discussing in earlier verses, in Matthew 3. Jesus was about 30 years old at this time. Luke recorded Jesus' baptism. This is Luke's account of, of what we've been, uh, what we're looking at here, uh, and that is the baptism of Jesus. How old was he at that time? Well, Luke's account tells us. He recorded the baptism of Jesus in Luke 3, 21 and 22, and then in verse 23, now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. Now, Jesus, when he enters his public ministry, when he's baptized, he was about 30 years old. Now, here is John's initial refusal to baptize Jesus. Jesus came to be baptized of John, and John refused in the beginning to baptize, to, uh, baptize him. In Matthew 3, in verse 14, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? Now, you, you can understand why John would be hesitant to baptize Jesus. In, in Matthew 3, in verse 6, what do we read? That here were all these people coming to, to John in response to his preaching and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Those who were baptized of him uh, had sins to confess. I think John knew that Jesus didn't have any sin. And then uh, b besides that, remember what we read uh, in verse 11, the words of John, Matthew 3:11, uh, that the one who is coming after me, Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Well, John didn't feel like he was worthy to perform for Jesus, even the, the most menial task of, of a slave. And then besides all of that, uh, in, in, in Mark's account, Mark chapter 1 and verse 4, we read that, uh, again, that uh, John's baptism was one of repentance for the remission of sins. It was for the remission of sins. But Jesus didn't have any sin. And so when Jesus came to John to be baptized of him, it's like John saying, whoa, hold on here. So, something different is going on here. And uh, so he was hesitant to baptize him. Now, in, in verse 15, but Jesus answered him. Matthew 3, 15, Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. John then consented and baptized Jesus. Now, you know, there, there might not be, uh, uh, there might not uh, be a lot about this that, that, uh, that we know, but I'll state what we can know for sure. And that is that it was the Father's will that, uh, Jesus be baptized and Jesus came to do the will of the Father.
In fact, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, we have a picture of saying, I have come to do your will. I have come to do your will, O God. So he did it to fulfill all righteousness. Now, here we have then in verses 16 and 17, testimony from heaven. Jesus is baptized, and then we have this testimony concerning him that comes from heaven. Matthew 3, 16 and 17 when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here's the testimony that comes from heaven. This Jesus, this is the Son of God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There are some things we learn, though, from verses 16 and 17. First of all, we learn by implication that baptism is immersion in water because it says in verse 16 that when he had been baptized, Jesus came up. He came up immediately from the water. Well, he must have first of all gone down into the water. And why did he go down into the water? Certainly not to have a little bit of water sprinkled over his head but in order for immersion to take place. We learn by implication that baptism is immersion in water. Another thing we learn is that there are three distinct personalities in the Godhead. Three different persons who are deity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because each one of them are involved in three different actions. Uh, in, in verse 16, we have Jesus being baptized. Also in verse 16, you have the Spirit of God descending uh, from heaven and lighting upon him like a dove. And then you have the action of God the Father as this voice is coming from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so uh, people are just wrong when they say that there's only one personality who is called God. There are three separate and distinct personalities in the Godhead, and we see that uh, here in this scene. And then uh, a third thing that we learn is uh, from this baptism. We, we learn something of the divine nature of Jesus. Jesus was God. Even when he was living in that body of flesh, he was deity. So at the very start of Jesus' public ministry, when he was 30 years old, the Father and the Son started him on his mission by testifying of, of his divine nature. All right, now I gave you three thought questions uh, very quickly. First of all, we have this thought question. John told the Jews uh, who had come to be baptized of him. He said in verse 11, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. To what might that be a reference? Verse 11, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Well, it means that God was ready to bring judgment on the Jews. The axe was already laid to the root of the trees. It was ready for action. And it wouldn't be long until the, the Jews... The unfruitful, unfaithful Jewish nation would be judged and punished by God. God brought judgment on them just 40 years later in A.D. 70. And Matthew says quite a bit about that. In fact, there are about 35 verses in Matthew chapter 24 where he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, second thought question. From the material that we have studied in this section, are there times that we ought to refuse to baptize certain individuals? And if so, when? You know, some might say, now wouldn't that be plain God if someone came to us to be baptized and we refused to baptize? Uh, well, there are times that we ought to refuse to baptize certain individuals. That is when people aren't willing to repent of their sins. And, and if that is obvious to us, where there's no doubt, in Matthew 3, verse 8 again, John told those uh, Pharisees and Sadducees who came to be baptized, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And I think the, the clear implication is that John didn't baptize them. 
he didn't say, you know, you're a generation of vipers. You're, you're, you're a bunch of snakes. You're, you're evil. And, and then he took them into the water to baptize them. Uh, I, just, I don't think that's what happened here in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, also, when people do not believe, uh, and it's obvious to us, I mean, we're 100% convinced that they do not believe, maybe because they just tell us. Uh, you, you recall the conversion of the Ethiopian. Uh, Philip preached unto him Jesus. They came to a certain water. The eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God. And then based on that, they both went into the water and Philip baptized him. Uh, you remember Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. There's no point in baptizing someone uh, who doesn't believe. Uh, that, would mean, that would also mean an infant. Uh, there would be no point in baptizing an infant uh, because he doesn't believe and he doesn't have any sins to repent of. And then... We should refuse to baptize someone uh, uh, who who just isn't uh, isn't ready uh, for some reason. Now, to refuse to baptize someone is that playing God? No, it's listening to God and submitting under the will of God, because God says that baptism is only for penitent believers. And then the third thought question, uh, how would you respond to the, the following? Water baptism has nothing to do with the washing away of sins. Jesus was baptized, and he didn't have any sins to wash away. I, I've often wondered, what, what if Jesus had not been baptized? What if you, what if you couldn't read in the Bible anywhere where, where Jesus was baptized? I wonder what people would argue then. Uh, you know, we argue that, that we must be baptized because that's part of obedience. In Acts 2.37, the Jews ask, what shall we do? What shall we do to obey and be saved? Peter told them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. In Acts chapter 10, verse 48, uh, Peter commanded Cornelius and his household to be baptized in water. Now, if Jesus had not been baptized, then I think people would probably say, see, Jesus had the opportunity to be baptized, but he wasn't. And, and either way, the, the, the people would use Jesus to argue against baptism. But regardless of what Jesus did or didn't do, folks, Acts twenty two sixteen 16 still reads the same. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Be baptized and wash away your sins. All right, next Wednesday evening, we will study Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Make sure you get your study questions out before then and, uh, and study those in preparation for that class. But with, there are certain ones we need to keep in our, our prayers uh, first of all, uh, Pat Garrett, uh, she's wearing a heart monitor now, but her appointment with the doctor will not be until sometime in July. Uh, also, Kent Rudder, uh, he has an infection now and is on anti antibiotics. Uh, Becky Phillips is doing better at this time. Dale said that uh, they're saying, uh, of course, he can't go see her, but they're telling him at the nursing home that She's had about four or five days now where she's, she seems to be doing uh, a lot better. Remember Dale and Becky in your prayers. Remember uh, Herman and Charlotte Peters in your prayers. Uh, you know, there, there are no cases of the uh, coronavirus at the Stella Manor Nursing Home where both Herman and Becky are, and let's pray that uh, that will continue to be the case. Uh, A.W., he seems to be doing well, uh, but I'm sure that he would appreciate uh, calls and appreciate our, our prayers. So uh, please remember all of these in our prayers. And uh, on Wednesday evening now, June the 3rd, the men will be meeting to discuss uh, when we will be meeting as a congregation. 
and uh, along uh, uh, talking again uh, also about the precautions that we need to make when we do meet. Uh, we'll be getting that information to you just as soon as we, we can. I want to thank you for uh, uh, listening and following along in our, our study. Appreciate you very much.